welcome to the Two Real Cinema Club. I'm James Rizika. And I'm Andres Lorente. And either accidentally or intentionally, you have landed at the Two Real Cinema Club, where we watch one film that is new, one film that is old. We start talking about them, and then we talk, and then we talk, and we keep talking about them. <laughs> Just keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> And this week, uh, we've got a couple of films, as we always do. Past Lives is a 2023 uh, feature written and directed by Celine Song, which was um, it's her debut feature. And it came out, uh, well, in the United States. It was end of June, had a theatrical run. I saw that. It's just out in, the, in, the, in this country. That's yeah. right. Yeah, so okay. we saw this film a couple months apart. That will be interesting to see whose mm-hmm. memory serves better. Yours. Um, <laughs> and then we also watched a 1998 film called Sliding Doors, featuring Gwyneth Paltrow. And that one, I, 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 I remember that one maybe a little differently than I re-experienced it lately. And I think you saw that for the first time just... I had never seen that. In fact, I'm not sure how I managed to live through the, eight, through the 90s in the I UK know. without seeing Sliding Doors. Um, but I think it's all about, it's all about um, the road not travelled isn't it? These two movies. Yes. So, so, so Sliding Doors is a road that I did not travel down. So I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm sort of living the film, really. Clearly uh, before not. we talk about the films, let's do the socials. We'll, yes. quickly, we'll quickly whip through those. On Instagram, we are at Two Real Cinema Club. Uh, we have a blog, at, which is Two Real Cinema Club dot com. You can come to our YouTube channel uh, where you can comment and harass us or you can email at us, email us at, uh, email us at mm. Two Real Cinema Club at gmail.com let us know what you think ask us questions correct our mistakes offer a sponsorship or point us to the latest research on parallel worlds we love all that Uh, tell your friends about us leave a review if you can it helps us out and you can find us on Apple Podcasts Google Podcasts Spotify YouTube iHeartRadio or wherever else you get your podcasts everywhere we are ubiquitous Um, so uh First film tonight, uh, Past Lives, um, which has uh, done well on the festival circuit, well enough for it to get proper international distribution. There is um, a lot of uh, Korean film and TV around currently. Yeah, yeah. I think Parasite a few years ago, that was a big moment. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, the music of someone called BTS or some people called <laughs> BTS, I believe. <laughs> Definitely a growing presence on the on the international stage. Um, and I heard a, there is a pretty good through line. It's an American podcast that discussed this emergence of, of Korea and how it's taken decades and decades, but um, it's sort of been in the works for a long time. And um, I think that would do a better job of explaining sort of this this sudden reinterest in Korean culture and Korean entertainment. But um, what you're saying is we're only two minutes into our podcast and we're already referring people to other podcasts <laughs> to do our podcast for us better. Oh no, that's like rule number one, cardinal <laughs> sin. I'm sorry. But... So Celine Song, she is um, she was born in Korea. Um, then uh, her family immigrated to Canada and then she moved to uh, New York. Bear in all these details in mind because you're going to yeah. hear them again in a minute. <laughs> um, she kind of came to prominence. Uh, she kind of, she'd written some stuff for theatre and then she directed a live version of Chekhov's Seagull um, on Twitch using The Sims 4. Uh, which is a video game, which is which is a whole kind of genre to itself. Is it machinima? It's called, I think, which is people doing drama using video games. Uh, she was for a while a staff writer on Amazon's Wheel of Time. Uh, this is her debut feature. Um, uh, it's, and uh, I'm going I'm to just uh, rehash her blog, her biog, sorry, which says mm-hmm. um, here that uh, Celine Song was born in South Korea. Her parents moved the family to Canada when she was 12. Her father is a filmmaker. She studied psychology in Ontario and then playwriting in New York. She is married to writer Justin Karitskis. So bear those details yeah. in mind while I tell you the story of past lives. Please do. <laughs> So, uh, in Seoul, in South Korea, a 12-year-old Na Young plays with her school sweetheart, Hai Sung, uh, until she and her family move to Canada. You heard this before. Leaving her first love far behind. Then, 12 years later, in 2012, 
uh, the two young people find each other on Facebook. Remember when that was a thing when yeah. young people used to use Facebook, and they Skype. Remember that many times uh, before. Na Young now using her Western name of Nora. She breaks it off once again because she wants to concentrate on her writing career. And then uh, the film jumps again, and it's ten years later, still Nora is now married to Arthur, an American writer. Have you heard that before? He, um, curiously, we see this little scene of him at a, a book signing. He's he's the author of the book Boner, which Love I didn't, I, yeah, I didn't, which I didn't understand why was that supposed to be a joke. Or, um, and uh, anyway, uh, High Sun contacts her again. Uh, he is coming to New York, and he would like to meet. But how will Nora react to this visit? from a past that she has left behind? And how will her husband, Arthur, take to her childhood sweetheart? Um, now, I know you watched it a couple of months ago. I watched it just this week. Yeah. Uh, the first thing that I wrote in my notebook here, um, I've written, this is a sweet, lovely film that is sometimes light and wonderful and sometimes as clunky as a broken gearbox. Yeah. I, honestly, that's that's beautiful. I I liked this film more than I should have. I think so. I wasn't in love with this film, but it's a nice little independent film. It's you know well photographed and such. But yeah, there's some clunky bits, and there's not a whole lot there, honestly. And I think um, we'll talk about how a lot of the great tense moments that I think could have been in the film actually were not in the film, um, and I'm not sure why. I think perhaps. She's a little bit tied to her own story, her life story. I think it follows her own life story a lot, and maybe that's not the best source material. I mean, I, we all like to talk about our lives, but they're not necessarily interesting, as Alfred Hitchcock <laughs> tends to point out to us again and again. So, um, <laughs> Must try to take the boring bits out. I mean, it start, a film starts, like the very first scene, I think is worth yeah. discussing, because it starts out with... The three main characters. Anyway, this this is a real, this is a proper low budget film, isn't it? Because there's just three people in it, basically. Yeah. Do we have to hit a spoiler bell or something like that, well, or do you feel well, like I, I, I've got I've got it I've got it lined up okay, here? Okay, okay, okay. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the first. I, I think I think it's fair game to talk about the first scene. Yeah, there's some beautiful without stuff ringing the bell. Yeah, I think the, the, I think yeah, that the, seems reasonable, doesn't it? If you have to ring the spoiler bell for like the credits, like the opening the opening titles. Um, You've put too much in your opening yeah. titles, I think. <laughs> so the, the film starts with an like like um, with the three the three main characters there in a bar, and we we oh. the audience are watching them from you know like a long way across the bar. Yeah, um, and you just get the voice of this unseen narrator, like someone who is talking. It's a woman. She's talking with her date, presumably, and she, like us, is watching the three main characters at a bar. She's trying to figure out what the relationship is between them. And she kind of says, oh, you know, I think those two are married. No, I think he's the brother. Yeah. Um, I think he, or he, I think he is the date. No, he's, he's the husband. And I think that guy's the tour guide. And she's trying to figure out just watching these three strangers, what their relationship is. And I don't know about you, I mean, I've, I've done exactly the same thing. I love to yeah. do that in cafes. I yeah. have drawn stories that have become pictures and scripts from exactly that. Yeah. You see two people walking past when you're in a cafe and you think, oh, I wonder what their story is. Yep. Um, but my my kind of problem it's a it's a sweet story and we sort of come back to this scene yeah. towards the end of the film where we see it from the other angle. Mm -hmm. But um, in this case, I think the kind of the director must basically have been looking in the mirror because this film is so very highly autobiographical. Yes. It's like you're watching you're watching the world go by. Uh, in uh, in the window of a cafe, yeah. and it's only after you've spent sort of five minutes writing down a page of notes on the two characters that you see that you realise, oh no, I'm looking at a mirror. No, it's <laughs> it's not actually strangers at all. I've just written about myself. Yeah, um, because the, I think this film's kind of main uh, main hiccup for me is its kind of underdeveloped protagonist. Yeah, um, you know, and and. Yeah, there is no hiding that the main character, Nora, I think, is the writer-director. Yes. Um, it feels autobiographical. They said you know, just the same life story. And there's this pitfall that I know I've fallen into as a writer. Um, and, you know, people have to point it out to me when I do it, which is that when you know the protagonist very, very well, because it's you, mm -hmm. you know, it's very easy um, 
to to fail to notice that you've omitted a load of details because you already know all the details and you imagine that you've put them on the page and actually you haven't. Somebody comes to it anew yeah. and they've recognised, well, this, this main character is a bit of a cipher. We don't really know anything about them because you've kind of forgotten to put all that detail in because you already know it. Um, and so watching this film, you know, I don't feel like I have you know, very much of a handle on the lead character. She's a bit of a void. I don't really get much of a feel for the texture of her life or of her kind of husband's life. I'm not completely sure what she does all day. You know, there's one brief scene where we see her at an audition, but it's, you know, it's not very clear. Um, and I think this leaves a bit of a hole at the center of the film. Do you feel the same way? I feel exactly the same way. Yeah, you nailed it. Um, and it's it's too bad because that first scene is great. I actually really like that scene because you're spying in on the movie, in a sense. You know, you're spying in on this scene taking place, and we are those people commenting about this this group of three people at the bar and who trying to figure out who they are. Um, so we're I was kind of in it at first because I really felt like, uh, as an audience member, I was just watching uh, the film and trying to figure out what was going on as well. It, and that's it, as you alluded to before that it's sort of bookended because we come back to that scene. Um, Close to the very end, not at the very end. Um, but I, I agree with you 100%. And I think my my first take on this is, and I sort of took a little offense at, at, at it, because this film sort of concern, con, confirms something that I already thought about myself. Um, and it's exactly <laughs> what you're saying in terms of like writers and thinking of ourselves as being uh, somehow interesting and uh, and how important characterization is. it is Because this film sort of, it sort of confirms or... It posits that writers actually do nothing, and <laughs> at first glance, yes, there's. I don't think there's anything inherently interesting about writers. You know, Woody Allen in all his films was a writer or a film guy or a director or whatever. Um, there's nothing inherently interesting about writers, so you've got to make us want to watch the story and make us interesting. So I don't think film directors, artists, and writers necessarily make great protagonists to, to begin with. Um, and yeah, yeah. these are who her parents were, it sounds like, and who she is. Um, so it does become very autobiographical. Um, and in fact, writers, yeah, we are kind of boring. We sit alone at a computer procrastinating, drinking some <laughs> coffee. Um, and those two things are pretty well depicted in the film. Um, we, but we also are doing work. We're undoing the work, and we're doing it again for hours on end. On end. So, I mean, if you just watch us, if you just put a camera in front of us, there's nothing interesting about it. Um, especially when you don't even show that. So you, you you never get a sense that she's really a writer. So I know what you mean by we don't who, know who she is because I, not for a moment did I believe that either Nora or Arthur were writers. Yeah. Um, there, there's one scene where she nods at a writer's table and scribbles furiously <laughs> later during this reading of a, some generic immigrant story play. It might be her play, but we're not even sure about that. That's it. That's all you see of her as a writer. And then... Um, you I, you mentioned Boner before. Uh, <laughs> nice Jewish writer Arthur sort of signs these books at a release, um, and that was kind of it was sort of my favorite sh shot in the whole film because I thought it was quite funny that he's got this book called Boner. But Arthur didn't look like the kind of guy who would write a book called Boner, and <laughs> uh, you know it's it's a it's a tight shot. Obviously, they're, they're working on a low budget, so just a potential bookstore, and he's in there signing it. And he's not really explored very much either. He's He's not an antagonist, not really, and I think he could have been in a sort of, in a sense. Yeah. Um, and the outside forces here are culture and tradition and time, but there's no real external pressure. It's all sort of internal, and it's, it's kind of difficult to make that dramatic when you've got people who aren't really doing a whole lot, and you don't really see what their problems are. Obviously, it's past colliding with present and, you know, potential uh, love from the past and current husband, um, but it wasn't very tense, and it just wasn't very interesting. And I think you're absolutely right. We didn't get a lot of characterization. We feel for them. It's like she's kind of torn because uh, her past is catching up with her future or whatnot or, or blending. Um, and there's some uncomfortable scenes that aren't quite uncomfortable enough. And I, I, you're absolutely right. We just don't know them well enough to actually feel for them. And they're not feeling all, enough considering the circumstances, I guess. So that was my biggest take on the film. Let's 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 ring that bell yeah. now because yeah, yeah I, ha I have got some things to say which will be spoilerific. If you don't want to be spoiled, um, <laughs> listen to the bell. Here comes the bell. Here we go. Oh yes, that's 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 my favourite part of the show. Actually, yeah. ringing that bell, it's, it's good to get some exercise. <laughs> I think when you're that's recording these things, not a good sign. Things. Not a good sign. Um, so. <laughs> So I, I, the other thing I like the second comment I wrote in my notebook, and this is like something I say. I feel like I say this every week. Yeah. Um. I, but I think this film is at its best when it's 
quiet. Yeah. And you know, and there is quite a lot of quiet in this film. And like there there is a kind of a bunch of basically silent scenes um between the characters um which I th- I think are just terrific. They feel you know, genuinely authentic and they're charming and they're romantic and they are heartbreaking. I mean the, the, the scenes I'm thinking of are when you know when Nora and Hai Sung, they see each other after a long absence. So it's this yeah. first scene when they see each other for the first time after a long time on Skype and they just look at each other on the screen. Yeah. Um and you know and kind of you know, they both kind of say, Oh, oh wow, look, it's you and it's kind of it feels so authentic. You know, and I'm sure all of us have been in that position at one time in our lives that um you know, you meet somebody you haven't seen for twenty years, and it's fascinating just to see their face and to be reminded that you know that they're alive, and then you're kind of instantly reminded of all the things that you did before, and then you're reminded of the time that's passed, and you know where did the years go? That's it's you know, it's lovely to see that on screen, and it's lovely for the film to have the restraint to to just uh, stretch that out, you know, and let those scenes play. Um, you know, naturally, yeah. there's a, you know, there's a second scene where much the same thing happens, which is ten years later, the first time when they see each other in person, mm-hmm. you know, having not seen each other for twenty years or twenty two years or something like that, and the exchange is much the same, which is just it's it's oh wow 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 look it's you it's you and it's a hug and it's it's just kind of it's all holding hands or look just looking at each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those scenes are very touching. It's lovely. Mm-hmm. I think those are great scenes. And it's kind of disappointing that a film that has the confidence to just let the camera roll on these long, long scenes of people not saying anything, then kind of ruins it in some of the other scenes by letting people open their mouths and deliver some extremely clunky, expositional and I think very unnecessary dialogue mm-hmm. um, to try and you know catch the audience up on what has happened in the intervening years. Considering that Caroline's song is a playwright those scenes which seemed most play play like those scenes where all the action was depending on uh the spoken word instead of you know the camera and the eye and the action of the characters mm. um those felt um like a real let, let down i think compared to the simple articulacy of 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 letting two people stare at each other in silence yeah that's why this film sort of confused me and occupied a i think a, a strange and kind of uncomfortable place um in the film, Nora's father's a filmmaker, um, allegedly, mm, and yeah. then she's a writer. And this film sort of ends up directly in between uh, film and theater somehow. It's like it's it's you would think it'd be talkier, I think, because you know obviously a, a stage writer is going to do a lot more talking and, and telling a lot more story through dialogue. And there's, as you said, there's not a lot of that, and that does give these wonderful, spacious, quiet scenes where where the characters sort of drink one another in and just see the changes in each other. Um, but it's it's not really cinematic in the sense that you know the, those images tell a little bit about. Uh, the characters, yes, I'm going to argue there's not a whole lot of characterization, which I already said, I guess. Uh, but they don't tell, they don't move the story. The pictures don't move the story um, too far along. Um, and it sort of verges on what, I think we talked about this maybe even last pod, um, what Hertz, Herzog, Werner Herzog would call the postcard filmmaking. And it's kind of appropriate mm. here because the guy is a tourist in Manhattan, so they're seeing the... the um, the Statue of Liberty and, and going around Manhattan, you're seeing all these sort of sites that you're supposed to see as a tourist. Um, but I don't know that that's I don't know that that's what those characters would do. I mean, I guess he, she would probably be showing in the city, but I, there's just so much more catching up to do. And I don't I really, really never felt like I got the connection that I had in Korea, in 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 New York City. Like the 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 beginning of the film actually starts in Korea, and we've got ten or fifteen minutes of, of the two of them as youth, and you know they're sort of boyfriend and girlfriend at that time, very good friends anyway. So I felt I always felt like I knew the kids better than I knew the adults, and I thought the kids mm. were way more interesting than the adults. And there's a little bit of going back and forth, but not a whole lot after those first fifteen or twenty minutes. So I, for me, I was sort of wrong footed because I loved that first scene in the bar, and then I thought the stuff in Korea was great. Um, but then I, I never got a lot of momentum out of this film. I never really felt like it was going to take me um, to a place that I didn't really um, expect. I mean, I, there are really two options, right? She either 
dumps the husband and, and gets together with the old Korean love, or she um, says goodbye to the old Korean love and stays with the husband. I mean, they're not a ton of options. I mean, there might be a third <laughs> one where she says, oh, you guys are both kind of boring me, and I'm going to go off and be an exciting writer. <laughs> but none of those things happened, really. So uh, I, I felt like, yeah, I think my biggest thought with the film is just I didn't get enough of the adult characters um, really living those lives. I really felt much more attachment to the the past and the and the, the Korean characters or the characters in the Korean part of the story, I should say. I mean, part part of it will be because it's a low budget film. You know, I get it. Yeah, it's I mean, it kind of reminded me of those those hundreds of short films that I'm sure we've both seen that are made in someone's apartment. It's you know where you kind of you get a few friends yep. and uh, and yeah shoot something over a weekend in somebody's apartment and it kind of it, it feels a little bit like it's shot you know on on the streets near where we live and in my apartment, um, but there, there's a difference between having a small story which is underplayed mm-hmm. and having a story which is you know frankly starved of events. I mean I I do feel you know just like you were saying there's just just not enough happens there's yeah. this central question question isn't it mm-hmm. what will she do will she stay will she go there's that on off tension you know and you know and that they sometimes they play that tension really nicely maybe you know like the other favorite scene of mine in the film um which is you know probably i would guess maybe the scene that you're supposed to um supposed to reflect on for hours and days after watching the film which is more or less the last shot in the film, I think, or certainly the last setup, the last scene in the film. After they've had, you know, their trip to the bar and, uh, you know, they've had their dinner out. And then um, uh, Nora says she's going to walk High Sun to his his Uber. Um, and while they wait for the car to come, and obviously because it's Uber, it never takes more than two minutes. But while they wait for the car to come, they just spend these two minutes just looking at each other again. Yeah. You know, it's the kind of the same the same sort of plot point played yeah. again yeah. but i enjoyed it so much the first two times that i was very happy to watch it again they look at each other for two minutes and then the car turns up and he you know he met he he says a couple of things and then they drive off and that's kind of the end of the film yeah um you know and that's, that's again that's a lovely moment and i did feel some tension about you know it was possible in my mind that she might just get in the car oh um I, you know it didn't seem impossible to me but then, you know, maybe part of the reason that it didn't seem impossible to me is because Nora is so under, underdrawn, um, so under detailed that I didn't really have enough information to be able to decide for myself what was likely and what was not. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't want to be a real downer on it, despite there being some clunky dialogue. You know what? There is some nice dialogue in this film as well. I did make a couple of notes. Some mm-hmm. of the dialogue is properly neat, I think. Um, there's this one quote that I wrote down. She said when she's trying to explain her her um, her marriage to Arthur, uh, and she explains we are like two trees planted in the same pot, uh, which is a, you know, a cute little image that I enjoyed. And they they often discuss this kind of Korean notion of in yun, this sort of in yun, yeah, this sort of romantic destiny that draws people together. Yep. Like over, I didn't quite understand whether it was over eight thousand encounters or whether it was supposed to be over eight thousand lifetimes. I mean, it's, it seemed like you know a very you know a cute, lovely idea. Yeah. Although the, the film you know tries to have its cake and eat it, uh, and I know I've 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 criticised that phrase several times before on the pod. <laughs> it tries to do something with its food. It tries to take the food away and also serve the food. Yes, because you, um, you know it, it talks. You know the film. She talks about Inyan, and then immediately after positing this idea, she also kind of dismisses it and says, "Oh, it's just some dumb thing that people people say in Korea when they want to seduce somebody." Yes. So it kind of it, you know it, I'm sure it's supposed to be you know, a bit of a joke and a you know a clever undermining of that dramatic notion but it seems like a bit of a shame to me yeah i would have played on that a little bit longer i was gonna just say that um you're right about like playing things longer or playing things at all really like i, I felt like it, this is a it's it's mellow this is a mellow pacing it's it's capable filmmaking it has some really quick beats so the the hitchcock rule that's broken i think is the exciting bits aren't big enough in the film um so there's stuff about um like um is it Sung? What did you say his name? The, yeah, uh, Sung. Hey Sung. Hey Sung's character, um, you know, he's you know he's in the military. He's got this Chinese girlfriend at one point. Um, you know, he's going on this trip. He's living abroad. He's going back to Korea. He's thinking about her. And those are really quick beats in the whole film. And even the way that um, 
that uh, Nora and Arthur get together, it's fast. And you're right, she does seduce him using the, the discussion of Inyan. Um, so those are things that I think would have been much more interesting if they'd been drawn out. And yeah. that, that would reduce those longer scenes that aren't as interesting and certainly not as tense. And I think the film would have had a better pacing to it. Um, for me, I think the if I point right to the midpoint of this film, I think this sort of sums up a lot of my concern is that... Um, at the midpoint, you finally have these three characters, and there's this chance for some conflict and some tension. And what ends up happening happening is this: the two characters, Nora and Arthur, just end up in a dimly lit bedroom, talking. It's the <laughs> midpoint of the film, and they have a thematic debate. Um, and the, the debate is actually about literally what a good story this is. Reunited lovers. It's like a total writer <laughs> moment. Um, but I think a good writer would make it a good story, not tell us what a good story it would make. Uh. Um, and Arthur confesses that their story is boring by comparison. They had the, you know, they, they hook up at this retreat. They end up living together for cheap rent. They're married uh, to get a green card. There's something interesting here, but it's sort of skipped over, um, and you know they have to spell it out that oh, our life is really um, a good story when actually maybe it is not a good story, and I think that sort of sums up the whole film in a sense. And it, you know we always talk about write what you know, but maybe don't always write about your own life so accurately. I, I would throw in some <laughs> moments there that are not true to life, and maybe there are some moments, but I think I would throw in more stuff that brings the fiction out and brings the story out and the tension. Um, because that's a big moment where there could have been a fight or a dust up or she would have gone off and called Hey Sung and talked to him instead of talking to Arthur. That's the moment that I think should happen at the midpoint, but it doesn't. And then um, the bar scene at the, the end is another example. So I remember when Ronald Harwood came and talked to us um, at school. Um, right. his, his advice, I think it was about the diving bell and the bu- butterfly, and I may have mentioned this before, so I apologize. But he always said, put someone in the room or in the scene who shouldn't be there. And that scene at the bar, you've got three people there, and one of them definitely shouldn't be there. And I liked this moment, but what happens when, I think when Nora leaves the room, the two guys talk a little bit. They can't really understand each other, although Arthur does speak some Korean. Or maybe Arthur leaves the scene and something should happen, and that's exactly what does not happen. Nothing really happens in that in that scene where the tension is raised. It's wonderful because... If Nora and Heisung are talking in Korean, Arthur can't understand. If Nora and Arthur are talking in English, Heisung might not understand yeah. everything. But I think it's a missed opportunity because what they say is not that uh, tense and it doesn't really create tension. I, mean, I think it shows that there is a difference between writing what you know and just dramatizing bits out of your diary. Mm-hmm. You know, this, this film feels to me a little bit like it's a kind of like the YouTube vlog version of creative writing. It's just like sort of cannibalize your own life, but don't put a filter on it. Don't interpret it. Just, um, you know, just just speak into the camera. Say what you think. Describe what's happening. Job done. Yeah. Whereas I agree. Uh, overall, I think so much potential yeah. and the end product kind of lacks drama. It doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. Um but it just feels a bit underdeveloped. Yeah. It reminded me of a number of other pictures. I made a little list here. I mean, before sunrise feels like the okay the the obvious comparison. Yeah. Although you know, before sunrise, those pictures they have you know much well much better defined characters. This seems just so much vaguer. Um, also reminded me a little bit of La La Land, or at least the very six minutes at the oh, end sure. of that film. I, you know, I'm a big admirer of that film, really enjoyed it. And there's a six minute sequence at the end where Emma Stone just imagines the life yeah. um, that, that they might have had together. And she imagines it as kind of as a musical. Yeah. yeah and this kind of there is something of um, the tone of In the Mood for Love in this film. Mm hmm. And, you know, and it shares ground with everything, everywhere, all at once as well, actually. Again, with this notion of you know leaving a life behind and you know the choices that you made and yeah. you know, the, the the road not travelled, you know all of that um, you know is present in this film. But all of those films, I think, managed to deal with the idea using some drama, yeah, yeah, which is just in short supply in this film. Yeah, I mean, I like this film. I don't want to knock it too much either. Um, and it's a great freshman effort or a first outing, a debut film. Um, but I would expect much more for the second film or the sophomore uh, effort. Let's, yeah, let's see what she comes up with. This film has done good business, hasn't it, for, for something that was made on such little money. So I'm hoping yeah, this has opened some doors. And actually, the very, the very final scene I actually kind of liked. It was very simple. It was um, 
Hisung on the bridge and all these, you know, he's crossing this bridge and there's all this traffic coming against him. And it just, it felt like an appropriate ending for this film, um, that he was just left uh, going back alone and uh, into the chaos. And I, just as an image, I felt that that was an appropriate, uh, a perfectly appropriate way to finish the film. But it, yeah, it was not something that I was just, you know, glued to or or on the edge of my seat or anything like that. It was a perfectly fine film, and I, I liked it. It's better than much of what I see over the course of a year. <laughs> better than many of the films I tell you to see, yeah. But it, did, it didn't thrill me. I think maybe, again, I probably went in with higher expectations, thinking that it was you know, an independent film that was right up my alley, and uh, I was a little bit disappointed, but it's, it's, it's a good effort for sure. What, if you had to explain it to somebody, what would you say is the theme of the film? I wrote in my notebook, you can't go home. Yeah. But it's not, I don't think it is quite that. For me, it was more that it's sort of dangerous to dwell on going home. Something like that. Like, don't, it's best not to think too much about going home. Either go or don't. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, it, yeah. Because you're sort of stuck in between these two lives, and that's the one place you don't want to be. Just as being stuck between theater and film, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be stuck to one between uh, two lives. I think you need to be in one or the other. One thing that Rachel pointed out, which I think kind of is, maybe is the theme of the film, although it isn't obvious at first uh, glance, is that um, Nora doesn't honestly seem all that attached to her husband no. or to Hai Sung. She doesn't seem super, super close to either of them. And it feels more like what she is choosing, the, the choice that she's made, is yeah. that she's chosen New York. Yeah. That actually, mm. you know, I, I, it fits in that kind of that canon along with, you know, the Woody Allen films or whatever about, it's yeah. a, a film about people who love uh, New York or people who love their their home. Yeah. In my limited experience, New Yorkers generally really do love New York. Yeah. And I wonder whether actually that is the choice that she made and whether the boy comes along or not is just isn't as important to her. That's a good point. And there's definitely a lot of New York that she shows in the film. So that love is there, too. So maybe she's got three lovers in this film. One good thing about film that's set in New York, it's very, very handy for the cliche squad. (sighs) I wonder whether we should phone. Should we phone them up? I feel I feel guilty calling them in on this like kind of quite sweet low budget film that did leave me entertained for its running time when it wasn't over two and a half hours. But nonetheless, um, there are some bookings to be made. I'm going to phone them. Do it, do it. The the New York area code is two one two. Cliche squad. Two one two cliche. The um. I'm not, I'm not going to come up with hundreds of cliches because because um, because there are hundreds of cliches in the film and to be honest, hundreds of things do not happen in this film. But the, the one that really stands out is is like the two ways or the parting of the ways. There's this little scene um, when uh, in Seoul the the school children yes. are, are um, leaving school and uh, you know um, Hai Sung has a path going to the left yep. and Nora has a path going to the right <laughs> up into the sky and you take this path I'll take this one it's laid out as two very literal paths um, and I feel like that kind of parting of the ways I've seen that in a lot of films you know and it's cute and it's nicely done and it's well shot but you know I've seen that a lot. I, I agree. And whenever I write stuff like that, I think, oh, my God, I'm a genius. I'm the first person <laughs> who ever thought of this. I'm a great writer. <laughs> and then inevitably it's been done. Yeah. Um, that's a good one. For me, I've got a couple. Oh, yes. Um, I've already talked about the first one a little bit. Just writers and directors and artists as somehow more interesting protagonists when, in fact, they are the least interesting. <laughs> There's very little real in their lives. They, like, create fiction. or they sh- You know, you should be creating good fiction if you're a writer or a director. Um, and the good ones live in the, the lives of the imagination. So you don't, it's not, it's dangerous. I think you've got to choose your writer carefully or your director carefully if you're going to make them into a protagonist because otherwise we do look like we're just tapping on computers all day long. Yeah, it is, it is mostly and time. getting yes. free Wi-Fi in cafes and trying to get a free <laughs> refill on the coffee. Um, this one I think you and I are kind of guilty of as well. So I liked this one, but it's, 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 we did it before it was a stereotype. Um, <laughs> Skype or other voice over internet protocol providers as unreliable. Oh. I mean, honestly, I'd be suing these guys if I were Skype because the Skype connections are poor between New York and uh, he's in what? He's in Korea at one point. He's in Singapore, I think, or he's in China at another point. So, Something like that, yeah. Uh, but we did collaborate on a similar scene Um so we're guilty of this cliche, but we wrote it in 2008, 9, 10, somewhere in there. Yeah, so something like that. It was crap back then. <laughs> um, the final one I have is um, 
Immigrants on Boats and the Statue of Liberty. Oh, the, how did I miss that? Yeah, yes. That happens a lot, even when it's just the tourist boat. But um, there's something beautiful about it. I've been on that boat, so I know what a nice experience it is. Um, but it's a little overdone in film. So I think that counts as a cliche by now. I'm not sure. But those, there weren't, there weren't that many, really. It's not, it's not like a big budget production that's just depending on some cliches to capture the worldwide audience, I guess. So... Uh, there are very few offenses here, so I understand why you were hesitant to call our friends at Cliché Squad. I have one last question for you before we move on to the break, yeah. which is, uh, and you are much better equipped to answer this than I am. Is it in any way realistic to be a playwright and be able to afford an apartment in Manhattan? Is that, <laughs> is that utterly fantasy <laughs> land or is that, is that in some way strangely plausible? I think if you were a playwright who's writing a lot and getting produced, yes. But if you're a playwright who's not writing, <laughs> no, absolutely not. It's, and no one can afford New York City at this point. And they were living, I think, Lower East Side or something like that. It used to be a little bit more affordable, but I don't think, uh, no, I don't think anyone could afford that uh, on the playwright salary. Not on my playwright salary. She might have some... <laughs> <laughs> Some uh, side gigs that are bringing in more money, but um, be pretty hard, yeah. But they do. I mean, I, I did like that touch, like that they had come together in part because they needed to make rent. I mean, that does <laughs> that is New York. So I think there's a big dose of reality in there as well. Um, let's let's take a break, and then uh, we'll come back and talk about uh, life in another very expensive city uh, in sliding doors. <laughs> This week's sponsorship for the Two Real Cinema Club comes from uh, our Mr. S. Bankman Freed, who sent us this email. I'm just gonna, I'm just going to read it out. Okay. Um, so he says, uh, hey, Two Real Cinema Club, love the pod. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we'd love to support an episode under the name of. Right, and he's written. So I, at first I thought maybe he just lent on the keyboard at this point. Yeah. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe maybe his company is called Futux, something like that. But I think it's like, it's supposed to be FTX. Um, okay. So, so anyway, he says, new paragraph, uh, we're the world's top cryptocurrency exchange. OK, Ooh, right, right. So, yeah. okay, F FTX. So presumably FT stands for cryptocurrency. Oh. OK. Uh, he, and then he says cryptocurrency has a bad reputation at the moment. Many people seem to think it only exists to facilitate crime like drugs and arms dealing, money laundering, <laughs> racketeering and tax evasion. Yeah. But that's not true. At Futux, we, sorry, at FTX, <laughs> we support uh, we support customers using cryptocurrency in all sorts of perfectly legal enterprises, including right. And then the email just ends there. Wow. I think I don't know. What, I think either it's a typo. Maybe he was going to come back and fill that part in later. I don't know. There's a big space anyway. I, but if you scroll down underneath that, right at the bottom, he says, um, "I hope we can sponsor more episodes of the pod in the future." Just between us, I'd advise you to cash in the crypto I sent as soon as possible as a number of unmarked vans have just pulled up outside my office. Oh. And someone said it was the FBI. Just going to press send now. OK, um, so <laughs> that that email was from De oh, December last year, actually. OK, I think that got hold up in the spam folder. Anyway, uh, thanks for the cryptocurrency, Mr. Bankman Freed. Uh, yeah. We'll see if we can cash that in, turn it into actual money. Nice. And, uh, and let's hope that FBI thing was just a false alarm. Probably was. Yeah. The white bands came for him. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure he hasn't controlled the drugs. No. Welcome back, everybody. We've already spent the money that uh, our new sponsor <laughs> gave us. Didn't take long. Didn't take long, yes. Yeah, it wasn't much there, really, was there? You can say that of all cryptocurrencies. Not much there. <laughs> um, our second film this week is Sliding Doors, 1998. Mm. I saw this when it came out. That's 25 years now. Oh, my goodness. Uh, okay. Directed by Peter Howitt. Um, stars Gwyneth Paltrow as Helen and Helen. <laughs> uh, John Hanna as James. John Lynch as Jerry. 
And yes. Gene, Gene Triplethorne plays uh, Lydia. So this one, similarly, it does not have a lot of characters there, but there are some love triangles and love squares in there, I guess. Yeah, plenty happens in this film, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, maybe, maybe too much. We'll talk about that. This is a little hard to describe <laughs> as a result, but uh, I'll do my best. Uh, screenplay is also by Peter Howitt, who sort of has a career both as an actor and a writer and a director. Um, hasn't been active in the last few years, um, but maybe he's getting on. I hope he's alive. Don't tell me he's not alive. I, th- I think he's still alive. I think he lives in yeah. Canada now, which is which. But but that you know, it doesn't mean he's not alive. Being in Canada, it's, it's a nice country. <laughs> um, he, I, I think at the time when when this film came out, twenty five years yeah. ago, he was like best known as the star of a, a UK sitcom, which is called. Bread, yeah, yeah, um, which I have never seen. Okay, uh, but I think it was, yeah, it was a big hit sitcom, and so people thought it was, you know, a little bit crazy that the, this guy was now directing motion pictures. Yeah. I guess it would be a little bit like Kelsey Grammer or something like that coming okay. back and, and you know directing directing films. Yeah, or... he he, I missed him in this film. He does have a part in here. He's um, credited as Chatty Guy. I think he's on the subway <laughs> yeah, at one point. Something like um, that. And I vaguely recognized him from In the Name of the Father. He was in a he had a he, sort of not a lead <laughs> character any, by any means, but sort of had uh, some supporting roles in some films that I had seen. So I um, kind of knew of him that way. Definitely, he, I recognized him. Um, but I don't recognize any of his other films, really. But he's had a good career directing television, writing for television, and, and little bits of acting as well. The listeners will be delighted to hear that you chose the movies this week, which is why we have two much higher quality films than we normally <laughs> cover at the Tudor Cinema Club. Oh, gosh. But, um, but how, come, how come Sliding Doors? Tell me why. Do you have any other questions for me, Counselor? It came to, so I guess I I cheated a little bit because I saw this film so so much earlier than you did uh, the other film um, Past Lives, mm. so I had a little chance to think about it, um, and for me these are two films like they're t- um, tell me why or tell me what if films they're kind of missed opportunity films they both have twenty something or maybe thirty something uh, women protagonists um, and I kind of like that and then Gwyneth Paltrow. She's kind of an immigrant, too, because she sure isn't British in Sliding Doors. I mean, it's like not, she doesn't feel that British. I mean, she plays a British character. She plays English, but... Um, I think I, th- I mean, I think she's supposed to be British, although her, yeah. her accent slides around it slides the country. Around. Exactly. Yeah, by, by like 150 miles at a time, I yeah. think. But. So there's, the, there's something of an immigrant story. I don't think it's supposed to sound that way. But, <laughs> but she had a couple of films in a row where she was playing... Uh, English characters and uh, yeah, she'd just done Emma, I think, before this film. Emma, which is how she got cast in it. Have you seen her version of Emma? I think I have. Yeah, which yeah. is great and, fun. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and her, she gets the accent right in that. Whereas this one, you know, it, it, it wobbles a bit. But it's not far after that that she's in uh, Merchant of Venice, I think, also. So ah, right, okay. She Shakespeare in Love, I think, is what yeah. she went on to. Oh, from yeah, this, yeah, isn't it? And yes. Then, so she did all these films in England, and um, yeah, I don't know. So that somewhere that was in the back of my mind as well. But I thought these would go well together because of the whole missed opportunities um, thing for young women in the city so I think that's where my head was at there um, and I think a whole bunch of clever parallels actually they're a oh, really good, good double bill oh, yeah good. absolutely good uh, do you, well do you want to tell, tell us a story I'd love to tell you a story maybe I'm going to tell you two stories <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in just one day, Helen, that's Gwyneth Paltrow, and Helen, of course, we'll talk to her about the other Helen in a moment. Um, she's fired at her job as uh, she's an executive in an advertising agency. She's, it's a silly sort of alcohol violation and I think poor, poor, poor work performance, but she gets fired. She goes she, down. Well, she's, she's stolen four bottles of vodka. Is that is that a minor alcohol in, um, uh, in, offense? In, come on, in England, that is a minor alcohol <laughs> offense. I thought she, that was in a, this film, this, that's a minor offense. People <laughs> drink a lot in this film. Actually, yeah, okay, carry yeah, on. Yeah. In London, come on. I was I could not keep up with you guys when <laughs> I went over there. Um, she goes down to the tube, and two scenarios sort of begin to magically play out. In one scenario, she meet cutes with uh, John Hannah's James character. Um, and she gets onto a, a tube train, um, but she ends up arriving home in time to find her boyfriend Jerry in bed with Jean Triplehorn's Lydia, who is an ex-girlfriend uh, of Jerry. 
In an alternative scenario, however, she misses the train, experiences a rather heavy-handed robbery and purse-snatching sort of thing um, where the insult upon the injury is a gash to the head. It lands her in the hospital and late enough that she doesn't catch Jerry and Lydia in bed. But she does have a very convenient, like, uh, dressing on her forehead so we can tell which version of her she is. Yes, that helps. And there's another thing that helps later on. I won't uh, mention it just yet, but that helps distinguish the two Helens. Uh, The result is two separate lives with two separate storylines wherein her boyfriend Jerry is always a hyperbolic and unsubtle dick and James (laughs) is always the witty yet not so pretty potential love interest. So that's the the get go that's the story yeah. the, the start of this film um and then it does start to split into these two storylines that are at times a little confusing but um clever um what did you think of the conceit i mean this is not you know this is the hocus pocus of the sort you know we we sort of get to see what would have happened if she'd made if she uh, had made the the train and also what would happen if she didn't make the train what did you what did you make of that conceit of the storytelling I th- I love the conceit of this film, the, the, but the conceit of this film is so effective and it's such a common kind of emotion, this wondering of all oh, what would have happened if, um, that you know, it, uh, basically the term sliding doors kind of became a meme before memes were a thing. Yeah, yeah. These days, you know, sliding doors you know, is, is a phrase that you hear all the time when people you know, suggest, oh, you know, if only this had happened, if only that hadn't happened, oh, look, you know, we wouldn't have met if we hadn't done that. Jeff or I mean it's 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 um you know it's it's part of the cultural landscape now this notion of sliding doors yeah what I particularly like about the conceit in this film is that they don't try and explain it with some yeah some kind of magic spell there isn't a fairy who sprinkles some dust over Gwyneth Paltrow yeah you know, and, and there isn't some kind of brain tumor that means she travels through yeah. time, or there isn't some kind of crazy experiment with Christopher Lloyd, or I mean you know this they don't make any attempt to explain it yeah you know they just um, offer it as a little thought experiment on yeah. screen. Well, what would have happened if this, if that? Yeah. Um, and the other thing I really like about the conceit is that they don't waste any time. I I checked my watch, and um, the moment when she splits into two, they rewind the film, and she gets a second chance to catch the train. She yep. misses it. Yeah. Um, that happens at exactly five minutes into the film. Wow. You know, it's, yeah. it's right up at the top there. They don't waste any time trying to set up the story world. You know, we, we get this kind of, you know, a nice brisk introduction. We yeah. understand who Gwyneth Paltrow's character is and the story starts. There's yeah. no messing around. Yep. Um, so I think it's actually a really pretty skillful bit of writing, considering it was Peter Howitt's first ever script, if you believe the interviews. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's, um, you know, he's got a hole in one. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. and it gives them a chance to really tell two stories, which is uh, a gift for a lot of filmmakers. Mm. A lot of of writers and directors would love to do something like this. Uh, I agree with you. It's um, it's not made out to be some sort of mumbo jumbo magic. So it just starts, and he sort of dispenses with the getting fired and losing the boyfriend and having an awful day immediately. It's sort of a, you know, those those things that very often happen in a film over twenty minutes or the you know the build up of the first act. You're right; it happens in. Most of that happens in the first five, seven, for seven, ten minutes or something like that. So, um, but I do wonder if you would do on a film like this, would you do two spoiler bills? Because they're kind of two stories that we have to talk Ooh, about a little yeah. bit. Yeah, especially if you ring it twice. You're right. Yeah. Like, shall I ring it twice now? Please, I've never I heard this before. Two simultaneous spoiler bells. Okay, right. Wait a second. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get a second hammer. Wait a second. Yeah, yeah. Wait a second. Right. Okay. You ready? Yes. Oh, it's even louder when you hit it twice. Nicely oh. done. Unprecedented okay. on the Two Real Cinema Club. <laughs> they could call us the Two Spoiler Bell Club from now on. <laughs> um, Jerry. God, that guy's bad news. <laughs> he's a piece of work. He cheats on uh, Helen sort of in both scenarios, and he's generally a bad match for her. Uh, it's one of these classic things where a nice girl ends up with a bad guy. Um, it takes... Helen longer to find out him out in one scenario, of course. Yeah, it takes basically the whole film, doesn't it? I? It takes a lot longer, yeah. So that really takes most of the film in one scenario, but in the other scenario she finds out very early on. So that gives the two, the director how it to sort of chance to explore two very different lives. Um, in the scenario that's heavier on the James character, 
Um, Helen sort of puts her life back together bit by bit, in part because a buddy of James just happens to be opening a restaurant called Clive's Bar and Restaurant and could sure use some advertising help to get his new <laughs> business off the ground. It's a nice little convenient uh, uh, social network there. Um, James is sort of this really endearing character. He even does some Dr. Strange love um, because doesn't everyone like it when that guy starts reenacting British comedies at parties and <laughs> at group nights out in restaurants? Um, uh. I think he's supposed to be the kind of girl, or the kind of guy that the girls eventually fall in love with because um, he makes them laugh. Um, and meanwhile, in that storyline, Lydia's sort of taunting Helen. She's the ex-girlfriend of Jerry. Um, um, because, of course, Helen doesn't yet know that Lydia's having this affair with Jerry. So um, you can see that the storylines sort of split a little bit. At, at one point, it appears that both men are cheating on her and that everyone, and also that everyone involved seems to be very fertile. There's a lot of uh, some pregnancy <laughs> in this film. Um, and Helen is really having a new life many times over. So she really, you're, you're following, I guess we could, I should mention that haircuts in this film are very helpful because in her makeover life, um, she has a short blondish cut. Um, and that's the, the life sort of more with James and where she's sort of becoming her own woman all over again. And then in the older story, I guess it's a longer Sandy Brown hair, Sandy blonde hair, um, where she's sort of still with, uh, Jerry. Um, there was a, I, I can't believe I described it this way, but um, with James, there was a very plaid lovemaking scene. It seemed like there was a lot of plaid <laughs> material or patterns, and it also it felt very plaid. It was a very boring sort of love scene, and I think it just kind of confirms that I didn't find a lot of chemistry between either the characters or the actors, I don't think, but Helen, Helen and James sort of come together, but then they drift apart because she doesn't understand that he's just pretending to still be together with his very amicable ex-wife for the benefit of his dying and demented mother. So she thinks he's still together, married. That comes as news to her. And then, of course, they separate. This is a classic in the rom-com. We should do a rom-com thing sometime. We what? should. We should. Oh, my God, yes. Because there are a couple of classic moments here. They meet up in the rain. I think on a bridge, too, right? Have we talked about bridges? I think so. Um, they meet up in the rain on a bridge. She gets hit by a van. This is whew, this is outside the realm of the rom-com, I think. She gets hit by a van um, where in the other storyline, when she finds out that Lydia and Jerry are together, she falls down the stairs. So Helen has had these two accidents in two different stories that hospitalize her, but I think they're in the same hospital, sort of. Did I get that? You're a doctor. Did you get that sense, too? Absolutely. I've worked in that hospital. That is the Chelsea and Westminster oh Hospital. Oh, my God. Uh, yes, I, I've worked in I was a student there for a while, and I did do some work there. Oh. Um, and it's, um, it's, I, it's the most beautiful hospital in London, oh, I wow. think. It's lovely. But part, it's fairly new. And part of the reason why it's the most beautiful hospital in London is because when they built it, they weren't sure if they would get the money to finish the building. Oh. So it was designed so that if they didn't get the money, they could turn it into a shopping mall no. without too much difficulty. So, <laughs> so it has lots of nice open spaces and lovely lifts. Forget hospitals when people really need shopping <laughs> malls. Uh, so there's a moment where... Two Helens sort of go into two different operation rooms, and for a moment, oh, this, I don't know if you had this feeling. I was hoping that they were going to have, like, a Travolta and Cage run from, like, Face Off. Do you remember Face Off? <laughs> With Gwyneth playing Gwyneth and the other Gwyneth playing the other Gwyneth, but then I realized that that was already happening. <laughs> and it wasn't so great in the first place, so I didn't need to see it again, but that would have been cool. Um, didn't happen, though, folks. Um, uh, Short-haired Helen dies, oh, my God, of understaffing, I think. Is that hospital understaffed? It was It was another one of these dark hospitals. I like a hospital that's pretty well lit. This one was dark and understaffed, and uh, James is understandably very disappointed. But in the other storyline, um, James actually ends up in the same hospital to visit his, uh, uh, I guess, recovering mother um, at the, about the same time that um, Helen is sort of breaking it off with Jerry. So she survives, I guess, long-haired, I'll say long-haired Helen, survives... Um, and then um, Jerry and um, Helen sort of ultimately leave the hospital at the same... No, I'm sorry. James and Helen oof, leave the hospital at the same time, end up on the same elevator um, because sliding doors seem to favor James's fate somehow. And they, <laughs> they hit it off yet again with another meet cute that involves, guess what? A Monty Python joke. 
<laughs> and a dropped earring, which is essentially what we'd seen earlier in one of their first, I guess it was their first meet cute. They have about four meet cutes, I think, in this film. I, th- I think the film is trying to tell you that you know d- destiny will get you. Yeah. You try and escape. Destiny yeah. will get you. It's 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 funny because it has a lot of uh, rom com moments, but I wouldn't call this necessarily a rom com. I think yeah, the James character is sort of forced as this comic foil again and again. He's the happy go lucky guy who's going to win her over with humor. Um, it's not really a rom com though, or or is it? What do you think? I I think it certainly got classified as a rom com when it was released, but. Yeah. Um, you know, the comedy bits are, uh, yeah, it's more like a fantasy romance or something like that. Mm-hmm. It's, um, the, I must say all the many, many Monty Python quotes, uh, that, uh, that James, um, that John Hanna as James kind of chirps out, they you know, really feel like the script was written by somebody who didn't know how to be funny. And so just assumed that quoting other people's funny scripts yeah. that was a way to a woman's heart <laughs> which doesn't make sense because the, the, the character of jerry actually is really pretty funny um you know he he gets the one line which is so funny i wrote it down in my notebook where he tells his friend i'm a novelist i'm never going to finish the book yeah <laughs> um yeah there are he does get a number of really quite good yeah. gags yeah um and so it, it so surprises me that they need to res- resort to these you know, pretty cringy Monty Python quotes yeah. to make James seem like a funny character. It's funny. I think both of the men characters are, should have been dialed down a little bit. I felt like uh, James was uh, always trying too hard to be funny, and and his was more in a delivery way. It was mostly the spoken stuff, whereas I thought Jerry was just sort of ridiculous because he was a little hyperbolic, and I think he was directed to be a bit unsubtle. Whereas if he said that same line about the – if he said that line about being a writer, you know, I'll never finish the book, a little straighter, I think it would have been funnier. So I think a lot of his lines would have been funnier if they were straighter, but he was this nervous comic type. And um, I wish they had both been dialed back a little bit. I think that's probably a directing and a writing thing. Um, but it's, it's, it reminds me a little bit of the other film. It's, it's kind of a light film, L-I-T-E. <laughs> um, kind of feathery, not super dramatic, even in the intense moments. I didn't think they were that uh, dramatic, but um, it's. I think structurally, it's in a really interesting place because it's it's it's. It, you're allowed to tell these two stories, um, and God, and, thank you for the haircuts because I would never have gotten that story straight without uh, Helen's haircuts. Um, I mean, there, there is. Comparing this uh, to past lives, oh my God, so much happens in this film, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just it's just full of like encounters and then parties and then yeah. confessions and then there's a trips and then and then like a farcical scene of blinds opening and closing and then yeah. desperate phone calls with hands cupped over the mouthpiece and, and there's like a girly haircut montage and then she gets yep. a taxi here and she gets a taxi there and there's a secret wife and an ailing mother and there's a comedy friend in the pub and there's a boat and there's a bridge yeah. and there's some Monty Python quotes and now it's raining and I mean, so much stuff happens. It's yeah. absolutely crammed. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, it, it is like the anti-past lives in that sense. Exactly. Um, uh, but, you know, it does mean, well, I was never bored. Yeah. I didn't really have time to breathe either. Yeah. Um, but I uh, certainly wasn't bored. It's, it's like the other thing I wrote in, in my notebook is how it's how 90s this film. It is yeah. a super, super 90s film. Super 90s. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of made made kind of at exactly the same time that I I came to London. Yeah. And so I was living for a couple of years in West London, um, uh, you know, and would walk over the Albert Bridge, which is the bridge that they kind of highlight in the film. And, mm-hmm. you know, the haircuts reminded me of debutante, <laughs> uh, the, the clothes, yeah. the music, you know, the, like the restaurants, like the landlines. Yeah. All these characters kind of having landlines, but they also sort of have early incarnations of mobile phones. But most of the phone conversations happen on landlines. Yep, yep. absolutely. Um and also the way that you know every main character addressed all of their problems through drinking and smoking. Yeah. That was a very, very 90s thing as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, So it's kind of a time capsule film for me. Yeah. Um, and the, the other very 90s thing about it is that it is largely terrible for diversity and representation, isn't it? This is a film. This is a film about white middle class people in nice flats having white middle class people type problems, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I'm pretty sure there is not one person of color in this film. I didn't, you know, see, and, and I didn't you, see one, no. You could say, well, is that important? I mean, you know, maybe it's not. It's a film about, you know, a time and a place. Um, but it does kind of stand out, I think, a little bit on the screen uh, these days. Um, I think you know, there is an element of um, of at least kind of 
proper representation for women in the film yep. insofar as at least you know the, what you know the, um, it's a woman protagonist and it is properly her story yeah um but it's you know it's very 90s isn't it it is i mean i, th- I think it it does a good job of also showing crap men too in the film i think that's important <laughs> it's a it's a nice touch which you know is probably a little, eh, probably a little ahead of its time for the late 90s um but I, I think you've hit the, the the nail on the head. Um, it's almost like there are two films. And for that reason, there's lots of action. There's a lot happening. It's a very sharp contrast to um, to past lives. And I think the this one, for me, there is that never-go-back theme. And you sort of get the never-go-back theme times two. But there's this nice twist, I think, at the end in the sense that there's – you could – pull some basis of the past or lessons out of the past are going to change what happens in the future. And I think that yeah, that's yeah. kind of missing in the other story because we really never get that. But um, it's, a, you know, it's obviously very well structured and very predictable in terms of getting on the elevator again and the earring again and all that. Uh, she drops her earring two times that she meets um, James on the elevators. And, uh, but, you know, it ends perfectly on that moment of, oh, the, they're talking about, is it the Spanish Inquisition joke that they do again on the elevator <laughs> the last time? Um, yeah, um, I think it's just uh, it's it's a clever little film. It's a great conceit. They work it pretty well. Not a masterpiece for me, but I I, I sort of like was in the same place that I was when I saw it twenty five years ago as a much younger oh. person. So I kind of liked it um, equally. Um, I'm slightly surprised this has not been remade at some point in the last twenty five years. Yeah, yeah. I wonder whether. You know, there's a, re- a remake is ripe because it seems like such a you know straightforward, fundamental, simple idea. Yeah, you know, something you can explain in a sentence. It has that kind of that other '90s sort of uh, feel of of having a high concept story that you can explain in a sentence. Yeah. I'm surprised it hasn't been remade. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I mean, for me, again, we talked about phones, and I think phones would kind of alter a remake for sure. Ooh. And since that, you know, your life is so public these days that. These are these are like an advertising executive is going to have a lot of information about herself on Instagram or wherever, and uh, I think it's there's there's something about privacy in this film in both of the storylines that I think would be hard to recapture. You'd have to really rework the phone uh, the phone thing, I think, quite a bit because um, as you said, I yeah, I do remember seeing something of a smaller phone, but yeah, it was you know landlines. You know? I mean, when when James is looking for Helen, all he can do is run around town, basically, to all the places where she goes. Yeah. Rather than, you know, or just send her a text, which is what anybody would do now, thereby eliminating five minutes of the film. But, yeah. If you eliminate enough of those five minutes, then the whole film would all be over in 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, if she misses the train, she's going to call Jerry <laughs> and then he's going to he's going to say, oh, Lydia, this was great sex, but it's time for you to go home now because my, my <laughs> girlfriend's actually coming. Um, and obviously, at any moment of the day or night, she can always just look at her Amazon Blink security camera yeah. and see exactly what's happening in her film. <laughs> exactly. I think um, it would be hard to remake. But you're you're right. It's become such a meme and it's become such a thing just to say sliding doors or, or not, a sliding door moment. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's something that we all think about all the time. It's like, what if and uh, what would have happened? And I like that. And I like the way that this story explores that because it actually shows it. And I think you don't really see it in past lives, whereas you do see it here. And I think that made a big difference for me between the two films. Yeah, they, I mean, they, they take the idea and they really, really dig deep, yeah. don't they? They ex- try very hard to explore all the possible scenarios. I made, I made a couple of little notes yep. here, which I think are worth mentioning. I, one thing I really did not understand is why... As far as I can tell, every place where Gwyneth Paltrow works, she works in several different offices, and in all of them, they never seem to turn the computers on. Mm-hmm. I don't know why that is. None of the computers were on in any of the offices in the film. Mm. Um, the, here's a little bit of trivia, which I had to check, um, and this is true. The Dorset Hotel, where uh, oh, yeah. Jerry and Lydia go for yeah. like a dirty weekend, um, that is the same building as the opulent home of the character in your Christmas or mine. Oh, really? Yeah, it's the same building. I had to look it up. I thought I recognised it when they went there. Huh, good for you. That, good that, that building has been in a lot of movies. And, and the other thing that's worth saying is, so this, this film was shot in 1997. That is the same year I gave my first anaesthetic. <laughs> um, so, I, and I, so I was absolutely thrilled to see the scene uh, where yeah. you know, Helen... Um, after her road traffic accident is taken into the operating theatre yeah. and there's an anaesthetist on screen We're with an anaesthetic yeah. machine and he's yeah. giving an anaesthetic. Oh, my God, that was so <laughs> fantastic to see. 
Um, and I will probably be one of the very, very few people watching that film who will recognise that the oxygen is turned to zero for the whole of that scene. Oh, no, no. See, no wonder she died. The reason, yeah, that must be the reason that she dies. Because they turn the oxygen off during the operation. <laughs> <gasps> So, uh, yeah, there's a there's a little uh, aspect of the film that people didn't notice at yeah. the time. It's really a murder story. But, uh... <laughs> I did think of you when you were when that was happening. I was wondering <laughs> what you would say about that. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so let's let's try and do our normal trick. We will try and kind of draw these two films together, see if we can see if we can match them you know, scene for scene. Yeah. Uh, but before we do that, we'll play my favorite game. Who am I? Oh, I didn't realize that was your favorite game. I think there might be my other favorite favorite game. It's my favorite game. Who am I? Um, do you want to get first this week? I do. I do. Um, <laughs> there, first of all, this is a difficult week because there are really seven characters maybe total <laughs> to talk about between the two films. I don't really want to be any of them. No. Um, I'm, I'm Helen. And I'm not sure which Helen I am. No. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't narrow it short down. Short-haired Helen or long-haired Helen? I think I'm short-haired Helen. Um, hmm. In part because I had my problems with the tube when I lived in London. And I always <laughs> miss trains. And I don't think my life changed that much because I just went on to miss more trains. So uh, the central line was good to me. I lived on the central line most of my time there. But the circle line, I had a real love-hate relationship with. It went where I needed to go and wanted to go. But boy, did I wait for that train a lot and miss that train a lot. So Helen in that film, for sure. And I'm just going to, in the other film, I'm probably that boring guy. What was the other writer's name? Arthur, I think. Arthur. Arthur. <laughs> Boner. I'd love to write a, a book named Boner. but um, Yeah, we'd all like to write a book named Boner. Yeah, yeah. so that's me. How about you? I mean, I, I had that's a cop out. I feel like I could have. If I, if I could choose to be someone in the film, I think I would choose to be uh, Russell in um, Sliding Doors, who is like Jerry's friend, who he's only ever seen oh, in, the yeah. pub, in the pub, yeah. reading a boxing magazine and drinking a pint. <laughs> yeah. That's the only thing he does. He's, he sits in the pub, drinks beer, reads a boxing magazine and laughs. Well, he's, uh, Jerry, that's, uh, that's, he that's the kind of lifestyle I could get down dispenses with. Dispenses great, uh, great information, great advice as well, I think. <laughs> but like in reality, um, probably if I am anybody, um, I, I think I am probably the woman who stops her daughter playing with the doll on the tube train so that she gets out of the way of Gwyneth Paltrow. Oh. Because God knows I've, I've spent many, many years of my life watching my children play with little toys on the underground and yeah. then leave one on the train and then have to run back and get it and make sure <laughs> that you collect all of the cars up before you get off the train. So, yes, that was my so, real life. But what, but what about the anesthetist? The, that scene didn't... Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I can't believe it. You're right. Yeah, but that guy's a murderer. We've already discussed <laughs> exactly. that. I don't want to be that guy. That's the end of my career. Yes. Well, the beginning and the end, because it's 1997. Right? Oh, yeah, that's true. The beginning and the end. Yeah. That's that's the road not taken. Yeah. The, the, the road where I became a where I became a, a anesthetist murderer. Yes. Right. Let's let's well, let's 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 do our synthesis. We'll try and try and bring these these films together. Yeah. Okay. Let's play. I'm, I'm a, I'll, I'll play the music. Okay. So I said at the start of the pod, these, these films, they're both about the road not taken. We all love that idea, I yeah. think. Um, spend more time thinking about it than we should probably, I yeah. do. Um, that what, I tell you what I wrote in my, in my notebook here, though, was that um, I, I wrote, both films are about the road not taken, but past lives seems like the watercolour version, light on detail, sketched in with suggestions. Ooh. While sliding doors is the Jackie photo story version. Now, do you know what Jackie was? Jack Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, uh, no, uh, oh, it means something very different in Britain. Jackie ooh. was like a 1980s comic aimed at aimed at girls aged nine to thirteen, something like that. Oh, and uh, and I guess to save money on artists, they used to have photo stories where they would get yeah. you know, actors or models to be in photographs acting out the story and then they would print the photographs and put speech bubbles on uh -oh. and it would be like it was a photo story so it was like a comic but it had photographs instead of um instead of hand-drawn pictures and there's kind of something very evocative about that kind of that photo story idea of telling a story and usually you know lots of things happened and it was action-packed and it would be people falling over and then 
you know, great big expressions and and people pointing and uh, making faces. Yeah. And sliding doors is kind of it's like that version of past lives, I think. Yeah, that's good work. You've done good or, work. Or there. at least kind of I, I, underneath I wrote sliding doors is the externalized version. Yeah. And past lives is an internalized yep. version. I yes. Think. Oh, God. And I'm glad that I said I said something about that earlier. Right. I said something about yeah, how, how difficult good. to the show the internal stuff. Most of the tension is internal and not external and difficult to show. Um, yeah, I think they're very similar in the sense, just thematically, this never go back or road not taken theme. And I think that in uh, Sliding Doors, they really go for it. They really explore it and see it and show it. And I think that's something we would all love to do. Like all these what-if scenarios in our lives, they're all imagined, right? And it's it's, I think past lives is a missed opportunity in the sense that it could have been shown on screen a little bit better and a little bit more. Um, and just by having that central conceit of her missing a train and having two different lives, um, I think Sliding Doors just gives itself the chance to explore one of those with what if scenarios. And I think it's just much more engaging as a result. It's not, I, yeah. it's not necessarily photographed beautifully. It's not filmic in that way that and past lives is i think yeah Um, but it's definitely more of a film and a more of a storytelling exercise which is a little bit ironic given the fact that the other one's about writers and and playwrights and all that so um i really yeah i mean i enjoyed both films Uh, this was a good week for me because i really did not have a problem watching either film i was really engaged in them both um and they they are similar they've got some similar storylines but also very different and also uh, I did use that word light. I think they're both kind of light films. I mean, I never felt in danger. Um, they were. I was in a safe space the whole time. Um, <laughs> but as a result, there wasn't a tremendous amount of tension. And I guess you just don't get that much tension maybe in a rom-com or um, a sort of a, an internal indie film like Past Lives. So you're, maybe maybe that's not what comes with the, the rom-com or the or whatever this genre film might be. But um, I think you still need some tension. You still need some antagonists. And I think yeah. that's that's probably the biggest difference right there is that Sliding Doors has them. James is at times an, an antagonist uh, to uh, Helen, and then Jerry is definitely an antagonist to both Helens. And then um, I think uh, Lydia, Lydia, is- Lydia is too, yeah. So, I mean, it's got in, in those four characters, you're packing a lot of tension and a lot of, like, convoluted, complicated relationships that make it a more interesting film. There's there's one other way I think that uh, films kind of cover the same sort of ground. I I think these two films they kind of one thing that's very important to them is a sense of place. I mean they're both yeah. kind of urban films yeah. and they both kind of love urban life. Yeah. I I think the protagonists in both films and and kind of like the films themselves I think they love their home cities yeah. more than they do any particular boy. I think. I think both these films suggest that for all the the sliding backwards and forwards in time or you know possibility that you might do I think they they recognize that it's the ground under your feet yeah. that actually keeps it all together I think hmm. I think in part these films are about the way that humans are attached to land maybe more than we admit and you know the place where you are is maybe more important than the time that you are or or the people that you're with in some some cases I think they are. I think these are you know, films that love where they are made yeah. and are very interested in the places where they are made. And love where you are and live where you are. I think that's the thing. You're, there, there's, there's these imaginings of living some other life, some other place, even if it's a mental place. Um, but you've got to live where you are, I think. Um, and I think it, to follow up that antagonist piece, too, I think London is a, it's kind of more of a character in a sense that he's just not showing the sights. And all, he's actually making London part of her problem. That damn too, ah. right? Falling downstairs, getting hit by vans, bad driving in London, <laughs> um, bridges that have rain on them. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it has a bigger role in some ways. I think it's more of a character in uh, Sliding Doors than the New York City is in uh, Past Lives. But they're definitely both characters. I think you definitely have hit something there. They're They're for very urban stories and... Uh, films of place for sure. Yeah, we like urban stories. We like it. We like cities. We did we a like thing cities. on cities. We, yeah, we, we like love cities. cities. We've done something on cities. Yeah. Um. Well, we we we've just got enough time, I think. 
uh, seeing as we're in the city, yeah. uh, to talk about what else is playing at this city's theatre. Yeah. I'll, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to force myself to go first you this should, time. You should. Uh, because, uh, but uh, this time around, I've only watched one thing, which is not this week's films. Okay. Uh, and it's not a film. Uh, we've watched Jury Duty, which is on Amazon Prime uh, in in this country, which is um, a kind of mockumentary. It's um, a, something in between Judge Judy and The Office. <laughs> it's um, a kind of it's sort of a documentary sitcom um, about uh, a court case. Uh, and in the court case, everybody, uh, the, you know, the plaintiffs, the lawyers, um, the judge, all of the jurors, everybody is an actor except for one guy. One of the jurors is not an actor and he thinks the whole thing is real. Yep. And there's a whole bunch of kind of hidden cameras. Um, and you know, he believes that he's participating in a sensible documentary about you know, what it's like to do jury duty. But gradually crazier and crazier, stupider, idiotic things happen. Yeah. And um, and he kind of sort of maintains a straight face all the way through it and takes it in his stride. It's like eight episodes. It's quite short. Um, some of the episodes, absolutely hilarious. And this one guy who is not in on the joke, the guy who is like the only you know, real person taking it seriously is such a lovely guy. Yeah. He's just really, really mm. nice. <laughs> um, you know, and it's kind of, it's, it's a real warm hearted, lovely kind of real life comedy, which yeah. I'd recommend to anyone. It's just great. Yeah. Really great. It's something that we could all, there were quite a lot of sex jokes in it, but we still, yeah. we managed to enjoy it as a family anyway. Oh, it was, oh, really? it was great. It's very, very well cast. That's the thing about that film. Cause I mean, all the, in jury duty, all the characters are just beautifully, placed and including the, the the character who's not an actor i think i agree with the entire he's such a lovely guy and he's the best guy that they they chose for that role and he's he's funny but he's just kind and uh he's having a blast and as a result i think the audience has a blast i experienced that sort of like secondhand smoke my wife was watching it ah. and, I, and i saw bits and pieces all the way so i got most of the story and uh even though i didn't really see it i saw it and i liked it um <laughs> I didn't have such a great week. I went back. Oh. I decided to go back to our friend Wes Anderson and try The French Dispatch, which I had not seen. Uh, I have not seen this either. Okay, so we put it on, and 20 minutes in, we <laughs> turned it off. It just <laughs> couldn't take any more. <gasps> so ugh, I know that's going to make us, or me in particular, unpopular with the the Wes Anderson crowd, but it was it was unwatchable after 20 minutes. But, and it was it, it's interesting because it, we just talked about uh, sliding doors and he's giving himself sort of a, an excuse to do sort of five or six short films and tie it all together. But you just get lost in um, the first 20 minutes. There were two, there's a there's a um, story involving. <laughs> You've already expunged it from your memory. Exactly. Well, the Benicio del Toro story I watched, which in, includes Adrian. Um, oh God, I'm forgetting names of actors right now. So. <laughs> it's that bad. Yeah. Actively well, the, trying to forget. The it. first one's Owen Wilson bicycling around this uh, French um, town, and then the next one is Benicio del Toro um, as an artist in jail, and that just we stopped watching. We could not watch anymore because it was just. <laughs> it's very self indulgent. Lots of overacting and. Just there was no story. There's no. It was. It reminded me a lot of Asteroid City, of course. Mm. Um, so we turned that off immediately, and then we watched. Went back to Only Murders in the Building. I started watching oh. season two of that, um, and we watched one episode, and that made me feel good again. Uh. The thing that struck me the most this week was a podcast. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell has a podcast right now that he's doing on uh, guns in America. Um, it's, uh, his, his podcast. Am I recommending another podcast? Too? You are, aren't this you? Yes, absolutely. Bad precedent. <laughs> um, his is called, This uh, is like going to the cinema and the first advert that comes on is an advert telling you to stay home and watch TV. <laughs> it's like, no, no, don't do that. Uh, his podcast is called Revisionist History. He's doing a wonderful season. I'm three episodes in on guns in America and I would definitely recommend that. And he's quasi British. I think he what, grew up in, or was born in Liverpool, went to Canada and now lives in the United States. Um, he had an English father and a Jamaican mother. So Malcolm Gladwell is kind of a big name in journalism over here. I don't know if he has the same cred in uh, in England. but um, I, th I think I'm aware of the tipping point 
yeah. book that he yeah. wrote. But yeah. I think that's that's as far as he's penetrated into my psyche. So he's uh, envy him. Uh, he's a great writer who's also now become a great podcaster. So <laughs> enemy number one, but what? Listen to his podcast. It's good stuff. Uh, listen to him, but come back to us. Yeah, afterwards. come back to us, please. Come back next time for. Oh, yeah, exciting. What are we watching next time? We're going to watch Dumb Money, which is the new Mm. film, uh, 2023, talking about the GameStop trading uh, fiasco controversy. I'm hoping I understand it because I didn't understand (laughs) it a couple of years ago when it actually happened. So this will be interesting. I think it features Paul Dano and uh, Seth Rogen. Adrian Brody's that other guy. He's not in Dumb Money, but he's the one in the film that I forgot about. Uh, And we're going to... Compare that to Trading Places, which is 1983, features Eddie Murphy and I believe Dan Aykroyd might Dan be the Dan Aykroyd, leader. yes. And we're going to see how well that's aged. J- James and I are a little bit nervous, listeners, because <laughs> we don't know how this is going to age, but it sounds like a great, great pairing. I mean, I remember really enjoying it back then, but I, I was in my early teens back then and had different tastes. Yeah, so. precisely. <laughs> So we will see. We're out there. We're we're putting us, ourselves out there, ready for the criticism. And I hope you're ready for the criticism, too. We're going to critique those two films, and we're going to have a great time in a couple of weeks' time. So come back to us then. Uh, and until then, remember, you can't go home. Yeah. Or maybe maybe you can go home, but only if you have a different haircut. Is that, is you, that the you moral? You've got to have the right hair. got to have the right hair. Cut and color job, then go home. If all else fails, just drink a lot, smoke a lot, (laughs) drink some more.